Welcome back to all of the participants, some of you being special invitees for the full week and others participating in the opening session today and on Friday, hopefully. I'm very happy also to welcome any new viewers to this session. My name is Bjorn Holmberg. I'm director of the Challenges Forum International Secretariat and I will moderate this session. Uh, we would like to frame this session as a conversation. And I'm thrilled that the Challenges Forum and our co-host ISS, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia and NUPI, have been able to gather such a distinguished and diverse panel. For those of you seeing this session through Whova, I can recommend that you recommend that you maximize the video. And if you would like to see all speakers in gallery view, please open the separate link to Zoom in your agenda. But without further, to further ado, I would like to invite our speakers. So first, I would like to uh, invite on board Marie-Louise Baricaco. Please join us, Marie-Louise. Uh, you're chair of the Inamahoro Movement, Women and Girls for Peace and Security. You are member of FemWise Africa and African Women Leader Network and a former member of the high level uh, panel HIPPO on Peace Operations. Pleasure to have you on board, uh, Marie-Louise, and, and please, if you can, if you put your video on. Uh, we also are really delighted to invite Volker Turk, uh, Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Coordination uh, at the Executive Office of the United Nations Secretary General. So welcome on board, uh, Volker. Um, I'm also happy to uh, invite Victoria Holt, uh, Vice President at the Henry L. Stimson Center. Please join us, Victoria, welcome. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Carlos Ruiz Masue, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General uh, for Colombia and Head of the United Nations Verification Mission in Colombia. Welcome, Carlos. Um, let me provide you with a brief introduction. Uh, 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 following the, 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 the um, uh, welcome session, we would like to focus on two specific issues in this uh, session, uh, and that is looking at effectiveness of peace operations through two lenses. First of all, the one using the full spectrum of peace operation as defined at the, uh, or, uh, of the UN High Level Independent Panel of Peace Operations, where uh, there was a wider definition going from peace uh, political mission, peace building to peacekeeping. Uh, to be able to deliver better and to adapt more quickly to changing needs on the ground. That is, define the mission based on the needs in the, in the context and not based on bureaucratic procedures. And second, and not least, we will also discuss and continue the discussion from the last session on advancing the women, peace and security agenda. Um, uh, we will let the audience direct some questions to this high level conversation panel. And if you do so, please make them sharp, short, uh, and on the topic. And be aware that you are many participants. We uh, think there are around 200 to 250 participants. So we hope to be able to uh, engage some of you in the discussion. Uh, you post your question in the Q&A function in Zoom, not in Whova. So maximize your Zoom window to post your question. Uh, and then we'll take to bring in, we're gonna to try to bring in some of the key questions. And please don't also state your name in the chat so we know who's asking the question. Uh, having uh, started here, I would like to start with the first question to our panelists. And it's a real joy to have you all on board uh, in spite of the consequences that we can't meet in person. This is a good compliment. And my question, and I'd last like to ask it first to Tori, uh, is uh, does the fast changing and unpredictable global context compounded by the ongoing uh, pandemic uh, lead to, I mean, it will lead to global recession, it is happening, and, uh, uh, and also possibly higher demand on peace operations. And will this also create a momentum for the UN using its full spectrum of peace operations, the range that Hippo spoke of? and being more effectively, more coherently, and more flexible, tailored to the context. So, so is this an opportunity with the crisis upcoming to actually rethink peace operations? Tori, please. Well, first, thank you very much and congratulations on 
a virtual conference. You've managed to make a positive out of the pandemic, uniting us across continents and wide range of jobs. So I've enjoyed challenges. I think I snuck into my first meeting as a junior researcher in Nigeria in 2004, and uh, you haven't been able to keep me away since. Um, look, I think that the context is pretty tough and it's worth a moment on what you just pointed out. You know, OCHA is suggesting there's 235 million people who will be in need in the coming year due to the pandemic. And for the first time in 22 years, we've seen a growth in extreme poverty. Uh, and this does affect women and uh, civilians, more uh, women and children more drastically. But a global recession is a really tough context. Um, and many of the countries in greatest impact are those that host UN missions. So the big peacekeeping missions, including Mali, CAR, Sudan, South Sudan, Congo, among others, but also some of the missions in Colombia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and Somalia. So that's a tough picture. The good news is the UN has, particularly since the end of the Cold War, an unbelievable set of architecture that it can tap into, whether it's traditional, so-called traditional, but creative observer missions, to politically smart uh, diplomats, to full-blown multi-dimensional peace operations. And maybe what we've forgotten is all of that suite should be available to the UN at any time. You know, many of the work on rule of law, human rights and accountability came out of the conflicts in the early 2000s and some of the challenges of the 90s. So do we have an opportunity? Yes, it's being forced a bit on us. Um, but I think between the work to look and reform and to support more of the political solutions to peace operations. We do that better. We look better at how to work with country teams and link up to the SDGs and long-term peace building. And we also get clear-eyed about where conflicts require potential use of force to protect lives and not necessarily assume that every peacekeeping mission can take that on as well. So it's a tough moment, but I'm optimistic. Thank you very much, Tor, and we are really happy to have you back. And we might continue to insist having you back, so don't uh, don't don't hide. Uh, Volker, uh, you coming from the from the Secretary General's office, what are your your thoughts on the 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 present context and the possibilities actually to use this architecture as as Tori mentioned? Please, the, the screen is yours. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for for the invitation. Great to be part of this panel. Um, just I think. If one looks back at COVID in a couple of years time, we will probably have experienced it as one of, a, of our teachers in, in many ways. And I think it's, it's important as we are in it and hopefully emerge from it next year that we learn these lessons extremely well. And a couple of thoughts um, and how it affects peace operations. Um, first of all, business continuity was ensured. And that was not necessarily a given. I think that was fantastic that the UN at large was able to deliver despite the pandemic, both in, on, the, at, on the front line, but also at headquarters. And you will see that there was almost a bit of a disconnect between a very strong operational response on the humanitarian side, on the development, socioeconomic development side, almost putting an emergency uh, thinking into the development response on the socioeconomic recovery, but also on the ob obviously the health response. The supply chains were made available to to the world. Uh, I mean, all the supply chains from the humanitarian, from from UNDP, and so forth. So that was good. But also then um, on the global ceasefire appeal that the Secretary General has called for, using his special envoys, his special representatives out there to see it almost as an opportunity, given the fact that it's not a military violent conflict that has affected the world, but it has been, it's a virus. So maybe it's an opportunity to get some collective thinking around it so that uh, different parties to a conflict would, would lay down arms. And we have actually seen, interestingly, an incredible enthusiasm on the part of people at large. I mean, there was a whole movement out there. Avas uh, got involved. Um, we have also seen a lot of over 140 member states write to the Secretary General fully supporting it. And we have seen some movement in some conflicts, but of course it's unrealistic to expect that that's gonna be followed, but it has triggered, it has motivated something. So I think that's an important lesson to be learned. I think the other one that is important is that this evolving concept of security that the Security Council and many others have been grappling with 
has become much more urgent than ever before. I mean, the typical interstate type conflicts have reached another dimension. We have seen some of these geopolitical tensions. So it's a question of how the current functions can be used for that. The inter intrastate, the internal conflicts we have seen, unfortunately, become quite protracted and intractable. That will not uh, go away. But we have also seen different dynamics within the use of violence. And we hopefully can elaborate further on this uh, because, I mean, I'm sure Carlos, in his situation in, in Colombia, we see the transformation and the metamorphosis of violent actors from, insur from insurgency groups to criminal organizations. Um, including post demobilization, which is a phenomenon that we as peace of we the UN have to be dealing with, and we need to be much better equipped to do with it. And the, and the last point, uh, the other big lesson is, of course, partnerships, um, especially with regional organizations, but also with a much broader toolbox beyond the formal institutions that the UN intergovernmental system provides. So I think there's a lot of thinking to be done on, on that front. Uh, over to you, Karen. Thank you, Volker. And, and it's interesting when you mention partnership that both uh, Justi Lacra and Sven Erik Söder and, and the two foreign ministers of Indonesia and Norway pressed a lot on partnership and, and the issue, issue about building coalitions, political coalitions to address uh, the issue about solving or finding solutions to conflicts, political solutions. I, I thought as, as, as you speak about uh, having learned from COVID uh, and thinking also about uh, Tori's uh, note on the great architecture that the UN already has, uh, the tools that were created starting with ANSO in 48 and then the first UNF one operation in 1957, even though created by the uh, General Assembly. And, and, and looking at you, Carlos, you are in a possibly more classical uh, mission uh, without enforcement capability, but having been quite large from its first phase, uh, and then I wonder, uh, how do you look at primarily the connection that Tori mentioned, if we talk about the whole range of, of, of tools to use, uh, how you connect to the UN country team, how you collaborate in partnership with the, uh, uh, the Organization of American States, having its MAPOEA, the, the mission on ground since many years back. Any reflections from your perspective from the ground? Thank you. Um, well, again, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation and, and to share it with the, such uh, great panelists. Following up on that, I think uh, there are two or three things that I think are worth mentioning. The first is that uh, precisely this context, I think, gives more weight and more uh, importance to the SG reform. As you, as you recall, uh, he is pushing for to be more agile, more nimble, in, in order to be more able to react very precisely to these kind of circumstances. And it, I think it pushes us to continue thinking in that line uh, in order to see what are the tools that we're going to be needing going forward in order to adapt ourselves to this uh, world, to, to seek for a comparative advantage, to, to, to use the full spectrum, as you said, of, of the UN capabilities, as also was mentioned by Victoria. Uh, so I think that's an important element that we have to keep on, on, on pushing and analyzing going forward. And in that sense, uh, it, for instance, with the country team, we are not an integrated mission, so the country team is not part of the mission as such, but uh, the country team does have a specific, uh, many of them, a specific mandates in terms of peace implementation on, on, on reintegration of ex-combatants, on uh, illicit crop substitution, uh, on the human rights perspective of the of the peace agreement, etc. So we are forced to to work together, but I mean, we do it gladly and very constructively. But if you if you but if you uh, consider the different uh, areas, for instance, what is important is going forward. If you go back to the COVID context, you have we are uh, analyzing and pushing for to not have a zero sum game between COVID recovery and peace implementation. In the Colombia case, for instance, the investment in the conflict affected areas is key for both. It's key for, for the uh, recovery of COVID and it's key for the peace implementation in order to, to, uh, to gradually put the state 
let's say, back in, in the areas that they have been absent for more than five decades. So our recovery, or Colombia's recovery, but then our actions, our submission, along with the country team in order to use uh, every tool available, is so, so important in, uh, for them to invest the resources to help the government in the post-recovery pandemic, but at the same time in peace implementation. And for us to politically work with the different actors in terms of making sure that that's, again, uh, uh, collabor uh, a collaborative effort and not really a zero-sum game as, as, as could be if we, if we don't continue to link uh, each other. So I, I, pr I probably leave it, leave it there in order to, to, to have a more interactive uh, discussion, but I think that's an, an important element from our perspective. Thank you, Carlos. And I, I must say that visiting your mission in October last year, seeing what you do, this tripartite uh, agreement to connect the actors and create conditions for peaceful conflict resolution uh, is obviously closely related to you and country team's work. Uh, and thanks a lot. It's really important in these meetings actually to get some some sense of what's happening on the ground, not just to get stuck, stuck in Stockholm or New York. So thanks a lot for, for your intervention. And I'll ask you more things to, to come. Um, and I would like to get back to you, Volker, uh, just briefly before we uh, let in a question from the audience. And that is um, a bit of a follow-up question when we talk about the, uh, as Victoria said, uh, the UN architecture. Um, uh, how would you say, uh, from your your seat on the top in the top of the building, so to say, of the UN, uh, how is the reform of the UN Peace and Security Pillar progressing, and do we see an opening for a more holistic uh, approach between the departments? Uh, let us say the Department of Political and uh, Peacebuilding Affairs and DPO working more in 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 synchronization, and of course then also in partnership with these regional coalitions. No, yes, I think, as always, reform is a work in progress. So it's, we should never give up the ambition of what the original view was, especially this, this focus on prevention, uh, as, as Carlos was also saying, an adaptable, flexible, much more nimble way of responding to situations that arise. I think we have made definitely some progress there. But it's not over and uh, we have just started um, within the deputies and executive committee context which is as you know the the style that the secretary general uh, has used very much to bring the different parts of the system together an in-depth study on on integration actually on on integrated vision within the un and it's interesting because we have used behavioral insight as a methodology and we we are not yet there where there is a culture of of making sure that the un country team gets involved much earlier in fact from the start of any mission and is part of the planning process and that we know what the first of all what the differences and comparative advantages of each part of the system are but then bring it together in a coherent whole when it comes to a, a common analysis but also a common a common approach I think we are moving very much in that direction. And I think some early uh, fruit of, of that we see in, in the Sudan discussion, UNITAMS, the creation of UNITAMS. Um, but it's, it's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done on that front. And, and we know this challenge. I was myself a young JPO at the end of the 90s when Kofi Annan talked about one UN, and, and it was still, we're still, stri still striving in that direction. Um, I, I know. Okay, if I, sorry, if I could just say, I think the the one UN concept is extremely important, but it has to take into account the diversity of the system and the comparative advantage. And it's almost like conducting an orchestra, mm -hmm. and and that's what we hope to achieve also through, um, you know, through dif the dis different decision making bodies within the UN system. And I think that's going in the right direction. Thanks. And, and thanks for that. And, and Volker, I would like to, to add one of our partners actually being in the Volker Bernard Academy are reflecting right now on system leadership, which I found quite appealing and asked the possibility to discuss this in one of the expert group or the challenges forum. How can you really play on the orchestra, the, the choir and so on, being a diverse set of actors with, with different interests? So, so I think that that might be a topic for the future, looking at how do you lead systems where you don't have control of the parts, but you need to work on incentives and, and motivate uh, towards a common goal. 
But thanks for that. I thought we should let in uh, a question from from the audience, and we actually have one question from uh, Colonel Miguel Salguero, who is one of our partners in the director of Caico Pass in Argentina. He asks like this, several panelists stressed uh, the necessity to improve regional and sub-regional commitments, both political and financial. How do you feel it could be achieved in Latin America uh, related with the mission in Colombia and worldwide? So I'll, I'll be uh, ask Tori to come in first on them. And of course, then I have to ask Carlos to come in with this question. So, so uh, uh, what are your thoughts on, on this story, the question? I, I think the SRSG should go first since he's in the region, <laughs> much as I would love to bite on it. But uh, if, if you don't mind, I think he should take the first crack at that. You, you are frank, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Carlos, she gave you the floor, so go ahead. Thank you. Now, uh, thank you, thank you, Victoria. Uh, the, um, I mean, it's, it's linked also to the point you made uh, before about the regional organizations that I didn't address in terms of, uh, of OAS map presence, and then the countries that are very much invested. In Colombia, the, the region is very much invested in the process uh, from the, from the get-go, not only because of their political backing, but also because of the observer uh, contributors, uh, as, as, as you know, as probably our, our, our audience, uh, we have a, a, a civilian, we have a civilian component, but also we have international observers from the Latin American countries themselves. So they've been invested, they've been investing in the, in the, in the process from, the, from day one. We have to uh, continue uh, getting their involvement because it's, it's important politically, but also financially uh, as, a, as, as a whole. But again, looking at what we do vis-a-vis -vis other actors, I think also we have to, to always uh, plan from, from the beginning, but uh, as we move forward, also we have to always plan to see when is the, the right also moment for the UN, because that's an important also uh, issue for the, where to invest, how to invest, and until when, is when the UN is um, it's ready to start gradually leaving and leave, it, leave, it, leave some residual capacities of our work, not only for the other parts of the UN, like country team, but also other organizations from the region that have always been here. OAS have been here in, the, in, the, in Colombia, as you know, for more than 15 years already. And we have to also uh, see how to, how to leave that uh, the day by day. So the region, the country, the, obviously the country itself with the support for other parts of the UN. And, but, the, but the Latin American countries and the, and the region as such, uh, I think, have been a very key, important actor and will continue to be for the years to come, not only for our presence, but uh, by and large for the Colombia peace process to be consolidated uh, through time. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, Tori, would you like to jump in now? Sure. You know, um, the Simpson Center, we teamed up with UN University and put a report out earlier this year that looked at one of the key parts of both the high level, the HIPPO panel and also A4P, which is the primacy of politics and how to get the political part right. Um, so I just thought maybe I'd mention a few of the findings. I mean, first, that strategy should feed mandate, not the other way around. And I think in some ways, Colombia is an example of that, where very much the piece came up uh, from the parties and those, in, those smartest about the region to the council. And we actually recommend this should be a two-stage process. So you get the strategy right, and the council then wades in and maybe even sets up the, therefore, the right architecture for success. Um, second, there is a mantra that no, no peacekeeping should go in without a peace agreement. I've said that much in my life when I was at state. But sometimes what you really need is political space for a peace agreement to grow. If you think about some of the regional localized work, in places like Mali, it needed time to build and be supported. And the larger peace agreement may not always be the prize. And we remember from Srebrenica that sometimes it's a distraction and actually can get in the way of, of a genuine peace. Uh, I'd also say in Darfur, that was a challenge. And then another point, given so much conflict today is aimed at civilians, not just by extremists, but those who displace uh, direct attacks, the kinds of violence we see, the peace agreement also has to stop the killing. So sometimes the political elites who may sign the paper will not actually halt the violence. And so that's another political lesson. A couple other really quick ones. Um, 
great cross-cutting analysis and it's something that the executive off the SG has put a priority on adding climate risks and other system-wide having better analysis starting with local knowledge building into thinking about the political agreements and having better more obvious peace dividends for the local parties so they don't think this is a five-year thing and the prize is only at the end um, and then last of all protection of civilians and political strategies go together they've sometimes been almost set up as oppositional i think that's wrong a good peace agreement will help create security for all people and if civilians are included in the peace agreement and are not harmed, they will strengthen that as well. So a few observations, thanks. Thank you, Tori. It was really useful. You can share some of the findings you had. Uh, I'll just check uh, online here. Marie-Louise, we're not having you in picture. Uh, if you could come back into the session, I think you are there somewhere and we really need you to be part of, of yes, there I see you. Excellent, Marie-Louise. Uh, I'll soon come with a, with a question to you too. Huh? Uh, we have another question, uh, so I'll, I'll just pose it, but I'll ask you, Volker, Volker for a brief reflection in, in sake of time. And it's from uh, Colin Townsend, Townsend, who is at, the, at Global Affairs Canada and also one of our partners and the host of last year's annual forum. He asked like this, this, like this, from the perspective of member state, what should we be doing to promote coherence of effort across operations, country teams, etc.? Recalling action for peacekeeping, can we devote more attention to the responsibilities and practical options available to member states in meeting our shared objectives? An interesting point because it talks about the responsibility of the member states. So please, Volker. I think it's, a, it's indeed a very interesting point and I, in a, in a way, feeds very much to what Tori has just been describing in terms of the, the outcome of, of that study that, that you have mentioned. Um, mm. I think there is no one size fits all approach anymore and uh, the the primacy of a political solution is is absolutely critical and if it's not if we can't do it through the usual peace agreement then okay what's under this and sort of you almost have a ladder of options and very clearly identified objectives and then see what type of configuration would work if the un comes in with a peace operation that is actually adapted and tailored specifically to the very specific, to the context of of the of the local dynamics and the regional dynamics because let's not forget we see increasingly um, I mean you have it in Colombia with uh, neighboring country Venezuela but you have it in Mali you have all kinds of regional dynamics play out so that flexibility needs to be there and built in and. So we are seeing an evolving concept of configurations that are specifically tailored to the con to the to the circumstances of of a situation and i think that's where member states would have to come in with a clear vision that is not the christmas tree approach or the pick and choose approach but one that is 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 more tailored to to what it is that we're facing and, and what is at hand and, and, and to me, Volker, it resonates a bit with the aid effectiveness agenda from the 2000s, where we spoke that the, the objectives can't be defined in 50 capitals. It must be built from bottom up in the country and be owned by those that drive towards peace. And I, I see Carlos nodding, being in this context every day, working with the Colombian parties. So, so thanks for that reflection. Uh, I'm really happy to have you back, Marie Louise, because I, I, I had hoped to bring you in on an early question, but I will definitely bring you on board now because you have both a global experience, but also working on women, peace and security uh, in, in, in both national and local contexts and regional. So I would like to raise this question before going into possibly more examples of what can we do better. Uh, and that is to raise um, the issue about the sustainability of the WPS efforts. The Challenges Forum, when we took our strategy last year for five years, we decided to uh, put into the, one of our, aim, our aims is to gender mainstream peace operations. So it's, it's a part of our bloodstream as a, as a global partnership. But we also see in a changing global context um, uh, with more challenges, how can uh, we continue to have political support for women, peace and security agenda? Uh, uh, and of course, uh, to sustain it and strengthen it from the UN Security Council and down. Any, any thoughts from your side, Marie-Louise? 
could you unmute your mic? Oh, there we are. Welcome yes, in. I did. Thank you very much for this question and for this discussion. Uh, as far as women, peace and security is concerned, sustainability of the support is uh, not only it's uh, something we need to think about, but it's a must. There's no other way we can do things. Uh, I think now uh, at the stage where we are, we are trying to see what else can we do. And in what else can we do? We have women to be included, youth to be included, and this is the time. As we see things developing, this is the time for women, peace and security agenda. It's now 20 years since we adopted the Security Council Resolution 1325. 20 years, which is which it was a very good move, but we can see that we still have gaps. When we look at the reality of the situation, what has happened after the adoption of that resolution? And I can see interest from the Security Council to be to keep info, uh, informed of what is happening when we see the annual debate on this issue. But I believe it is time now to move forward. Not only debate, because debate is debate, but then what? Today, I think a Security Council need to think about how do we ensure that women peace and security agenda is a reality because it is good that we have the policy, the legal framework, but as we were saying in the, in the HIPPO, we need all these frameworks to be implemented. And when we need to be, we see them implemented, then we put, we put things in reality. And I believe that uh, in that perspective, peace operations need to be people oriented. When they are people oriented, they will have to work with the people, with the communities. And when we work, they work with the communities, then they know exactly what are the issues and what are, what are the possible solutions. Until now, it is a theory. But in practice, women are not included and their challenges and perspectives and uh, uh, concerns are not really included when we have we look at what is happening. That is why today, until nine, uh, 2019, we had this kind of figures where we have only 13% of women negotiators, only 6% of women mediators, and 6% of women signatories of the peace agreements. This is too low if we say that we have this resolution and all these other instruments, this is really too low. So I think that as UN Security Council should look at how do we engage politically to adopt policies that make it an obligation for whatever action is taken to include women. And whatever strategy or program adopted include a gender dimension. And whatever report is presented has to have that gender dimension. I think this should be a policy. And then if you, are, you don't, don't apply it, your report is not accepted. If you don't apply it, the committee you are proposing will not be accepted. I think this should be the next stage really to, 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 to adopt. And then also remember and keep in mind that as we make them people-centered, uh, then we involve them whether it is in uh, prevention or it is in peacekeeping or if, if it is in peace building, we need always to involve them because they are the only ones who can know exactly what they need. Someone said, uh, and I liked it when we we're discussing in the hippo, that no, no even if, even if um, how you call, how call them those who shave, who shave you, even if he's a very good one, he cannot make your head look nice until your head is there, you see? So until you are there, until you are there, nobody can take care of you the way you could take care of yourself. 
So I think it is very important that this policy be adopted by Security Council. And it is very important that uh, when we talk about the national action plans or regional action plans, it is very important that we think about concrete implementation, concrete action. What do we expect from those action plans? And how do we measure, how do we measure the results of the action plans? I think these are the kind of things we should think about if we need the uh, women, peace and security agenda to be sustained and to move forward and to show impact. Marie Louise, mm -hmm. thank you very much. I, I was reflecting a bit on the last session with uh, uh, the opening session where we also raised the WPS agenda. And I think we reflected a bit from more a functionalistic approach. How can you more effectively reach peace? So how can you make more effective peace operations? But what I hear between the lines from your side is more a rights-based approach. It's also about the rights of everyone being equally represented. Um, and you also provide us with both an advice to do the top-down, the role of the UN Security Council actually to push from top-down. But it's interesting to hear that you talk about national uh, uh, plans. You know, what could you do concretely? You, you stress the concrete aspect. And if you allow me, Marie Louise, and I'll let you come back, I would like to ask Carlos, being in a mission, uh, from your perspective, what are you doing concretely uh, to provide, uh, I mean, empower women uh, at the local and the national level? You work on both. And love to have your reflections after Carlos Marie Luis uh, on, on what he presents. Please, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, look, the, I think the Colombia example and probably the Colombia legacy, one of the issues is the full involvement of women from day one that has ensured that the women, peace and security agenda and the gender dimension is fully included in the, in the peace agreement and in our everyday efforts. Uh, from day one, there was a subcommittee of gender issues in, Havana, in the Havana talks that was very important to ensure that the gender provision was there. We have more than 100 provisions of gender in the agreement as such. We have different instances for the implementation of gender-related issues. We have indicators to measure precisely how those issues are being addressed. Myself, I, I have regular meetings with the gender organizations, uh, women platforms, uh, in order also to see their assessment on how the implementation of the gender provisions are, are being, um, uh, 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 how, how the implementation is going. Also to ensure that they are, they are on board. We have just two examples. We have gender related uh, aspects on the reintegration of ex-combatants in order to ensure that the leadership role that they used to perform when they were back uh, as uh, combatants, now they want to lead their reintegration process. And uh, we, we have to, uh, to ensure that we have all in place in order to, to, uh, to allow them to do that. And there's a security aspect to it as well. Uh, uh, we have that mandate in order to ensure the, the security of ex-combatants. And uh, sometimes for being uh, women, they have a specific risk and specific dangers for women social leaders, for women human rights defenders, uh, and leaders of the community. And we are always talking to the different uh, parties, but particularly to the government in this case, in order to, to ensure that they have the, not only the programs, but the action plans actually to defend, uh, to, to protect them and to defend them in order to ensure that they can perform the leadership role that they do on the ground. So in, in, in a nutshell, I think Colombia is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I believe, a good example. Uh, it obviously, is, we're not uh, perfect, and we're not perfect in the implementation. There's a slow rate of implementation vis-a-vis -vis the provisions, but, um, but, uh, but we are uh, very much keen on uh, in pushing the agenda, uh, and I believe it's a, it's a good example for others to follow. Now, one important aspect, uh, it's that, uh, as Victoria said, in terms of the process and the agreement, it's a very much nationally owned uh, agreement. So it's, it's the parties that make this happen from the beginning, but we have to find what is the UN role in the future in these cases. Sometimes we are not the main actor in the negotiations, we are an observer, sometimes we provide technical assistance to the parties. So we have to ensure that in those roles, the Women, Peace and Security agenda is clearly part of our main priorities in order to 
to, to make sure that the different processes include uh, the gender uh, dimension uh, in the peace agreement and then in the peace implementation process. Thank you, Carlos, for, for and I'll last, let you, Marilis, Marilis, to come in. But I just want to say first one thing is um, if anyone would like to pose in the audience a question of WPS, uh, please do so now. Uh, and, and, and my colleagues will pick it up for me to, to, to pose to the panelists. Uh, thanks, Carlos, for sharing. And I think the reintegration aspect is really important because even though research shows that more gender equal societies are more peaceful, and that uh, violent conflict sometimes breaks traditional gender roles, uh, expanding you know, the, the, the amount of, of influence of women, uh, the reintegration at the end of conflict also traditionally means going back to traditional roles. So it's interesting to listen to what you're doing in Colombia. marie Luis, any thoughts from your side and your experiences on what Carlos said and, and the, the practical means on the ground, aside from the national plans and the UN Security Council? What would you say are, 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 are key aspects in mission areas? If it's a political mission or, or, or peacekeeping mission of the AU or the UN or whoever. You, your mic, Marie. Ah, I'm sorry, I it's agree technology. that uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's very important to, to be involve the community from the beginning. It is very important and uh, the the first thing that can be done is to ensure that uh, at every stage, women are involved. Whether they are preparing, whether they're implementing, whether they are consulting, doing the consultations, they are involved. This is a, a one very big uh, issue. Another aspect that needs to be taken into consideration when they are preparing the peace uh, operation mission is are we, do we know that women have specific needs? For instance, when they are taken into a um, peace mission, there are some specific needs they have. And uh, for those who organize to make sure that they have taken into consideration those needs, it shows their concern and it shows that they are willing to have women contribute effectively because it is one thing to have them it is another thing to have them make an impact in their contribution. And you need to give them the means. I can talk about, for instance, uh, you know, even, you know, laboratories. Or where do they have their, uh, if they have families, if they have left families, do they have any opportunity to interact with their families from far away where they are on the mission? Because women, they leave children behind. It's, it's true, men also leave children behind, but they, the burden is not the same. So those who organize the mission need to show that they are, they are aware of that kind of need. Women will need, uh, they have some uh, intimate issues, things they need. Do they have a, a gynecologist at the, uh, at the camp, for instance? Do they have a place where they can uh, buy those things they need? For instance, these are small, small things, but which make the work of women easy or not easy. And I think when they're organizing the mission, sometimes they do just have a camp, not really thinking that they have men and women, but they have all of them together. When they go for, uh, for, for shower, they go to the same places where you meet men, it's not easy. So these are the kind of things they can make to make things happen and also to show that they know there are women and there are men. Not to make distinction, but to show that they are aware of the specific needs of the people. And this is something that is very important and that encourage women to accept to be part of the missions or not be part of the missions. And another thing is, uh, is not just having women as women, but giving them opportunity to act and interact with the communities, interact with the actors, and bring in the gender perspective. Because it is, uh, it is one thing to be there, and it is one thing to be able to make the influence you need to make so that things can move in a better way. So these are the kind of practical things that I can suggest. And another thing is that uh, 
if you want really the mission to, to, to be, to show inclusivity, it will be important for Security Council to decide on the parity principle of the missions. If the parity is not possible immediately, at least there must be a um, uh, kind of quota. It can be 30, it can be 40% while waiting for 50%, but it has to be, there must be a quota. And that quota, once it is there, Security Council will ensure that it is respected. And when it is not respected, find ways of, of, uh, of questioning or refusing a um, team which is not composed the way the Security Council decided. Mm -hmm. Another opportunity is also um, the way they can organize in such a way that uh, women can also take responsibilities. It is not only men who can be leaders of the, of the teams, women can lead. Women can be mediators. Women can be negotiators. Women can be peacekeepers, the, the head of, uh, uh, of uh, teams of uh, peacekeeping. So it's, it's important to allow them to show that they can do it. But until they have that opportunity, nobody will know that they can do it. Ma so, uh, why, don't, yes. why don't we end on that note? Because what you're saying is uh, about uh, allowing women leadership. And, and I can share with you, we talked about in the last session that the Challenges Forum is now launching a, uh, uh, the consideration study on uh, mission leadership uh, in UN peace operations, which emphasizes uh, gender mainstreaming in leadership. Um, so I think that's a good note. And also you stressing the importance of concrete action and accountability. And as you might know, every annual forum we do end up in a, in a short roll of, of recommendations where we always also add accountability. Who is accountable to implementation among member states or is it part of civil society or the UN Secretariat and so on. So you raising accountability is, is very well received. And I see that we are struggling with the internet connection. So um, I hope you will be back soon, uh, Marie-Louise. Uh, we have to go to the next question. Uh, and of course, all these questions deserve at least one or two hours each, but uh, that is not what we have right now. Um, so uh, the next, uh, which I think is getting us close to the wrap up, and I'll ask this to Tori first, and then uh, uh, hopefully uh, Volker, you can come in on it too. And it comes back a bit to my first question. And knowing of, <coughs> sorry, of the Stimson study and also a Security Council report on, on, on political primacy, the, the one of the eight cornerstones of action for peacekeeping, and something that is raised by many, it was raised by the, uh, by the Norwegian foreign ministry in the opening. Um, uh, we talk a lot now about the focus on political solutions. We talk about the, limit, uh, the limited use of force, Colombia being an example, not having the enforcement component. And we talk about strategic partnerships uh, with regional organizations, a, a bit of, of reshaping possibly the instruments we have at hand. And then my question is to you, Tori, do you think there is a growing shared understanding globally, or maybe not shared, but is there a growing, growing understanding uh, of uh, how we can use peace operation more, more effectively? Are, are we seeing a change here, Tori? Well, thank you very much. And before I answer your question, I just want to agree with Mary Louise and also Carlos's points. There's a lot more data today about the role of women. They've been in short supply as peacekeepers. So I'm hopeful that the LC initiative will help support figuring out how to better address that. Um, yes, and I noticed that you this almost tease up the rest of some of your program and that congratulations to challenges and your, your co-sponsors for looking at the regional role, for looking at long-term peace building. Um, First, on the financial political mix, uh, nations, including the United States, need to pay their assessments in full. And I hope that the new US government will do that. It may take a little time, but that's a starting point. And I would also say I'm always shocked to realize that the DPPA has to go out with a tin can and raise money for itself as well. Those are in arrears, but they have to have extra budgetary. So first of all, the UN needs the resources, both human and financial, to do the job it's being asked to do. So, that's part of the politics. And I think we might be heading into a real multilateral moment. The pandemic has reminded every nation on the world that problems cross borders. We all say it, 
but it's real. So I, I think that's part of what you're talking about. Um, I think there's an immense role for regional organizations. I mean, you look at the Security Council today, and peace operations is one of the areas where there's still high levels of cooperation, but it gets quite fractured. Um, and regional organizations can bring a lot to bear in understanding the politics and doing the negotiations and being much closer to what's going on. But it's not a panacea. You know, look at the divisions in EGAD over South Sudan. And these countries disagree, were disagreeing on the way forward. And so the Security Council and the member states who are outside the region also have a very important role to stay in place, particularly for countries who may be disinterested, who can run mediation, provide support, uh, and back up, back up peace agreements. Two other quick points. The nature of conflict is harder. Civilians are often targeted. We've mentioned it. David Miliband talks about an age of impunity where whether you look at Pathways for Peace or other studies, the, the regard for international human rights and humanitarian law has reduced non-state actors, proxy wars, internationalized civil conflicts, some conflicts that are enduring over years. This is much tougher than what some of the original peace operations were designed to do. So with that, we also have to be more clever. And one of those things is figuring out, again, how we maximize missions ability to deter, prevent, and protect civilians, which is part of the mandate of many missions. I think today, 95% of peacekeepers serve with mandates to protect. And we know the UN has gone immense directions to build that out as a political strategy, as physical protection, as environment shape. But there are times when you're talking about civilians being at the heart of a conflict, and that's peace enforcement. And I don't think we should confuse the two. Um, so for the UN to work with regionals, particularly in Africa, with two issues. One, if the UN becomes a party to the conflict, it is not, it, it, peacekeepers are, are soft targets. So I think co-housing them and co-funding with the peace enforcement mission is deeply fraught. And I know we've done it in Somalia and it's being debated, it's the G5 cell is another example. I think we really need to think that through and create enough separation so that peace enforcement who can go in and use force, stop bad actors is not conflated with peacekeeping. And that's not a financial thing. Definitely there could be a financial arrangement through the charter's provisions on a case-by-case -case basis. The OAS has such an agreement, the AU and ECOWAS could do it, where there's an agreement for certain types of missions to provide support, but it's not a blank check. And I think those are two separate issues. Anyway, I packed a little bit too much into that answer. Back that's over great. to you. <laughs> you need to use your space, that's, well, that's welcome. And, and I think when you talk about uh, the conceptual issues, already in the 90s, we were talking about that in Bosnia and onwards, that we were kind of breaking the traditional limit of use of force, going from chapter six and a half to seven, the traditional ones. And, and I think that there's a lot of discussion now, should we revisit the capstone doctrine? Should we think about the whole spectrum and what works and what not to adapt the, the tools to the, the context that we, where we apply them? And of course, not us from external side applying, but together with the, the, the uh, country. Uh, Volker, would you like to have a pitch on this, uh, on a possible yeah. new way of understanding peace operations, please? No, thanks. And I go back a little bit to the lessons learned from COVID. Um, I mean, one of the lessons learned will be investment in preparedness and predictive analytics meaning that we actually understand much better what may happen, that we anticipate, that we engage in strategic foresight, that we try to analyze well, but that we really identify the deep causes and, 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 and what is the complexity of a particular situation. We know that most situations are much more complex than an interstate type conflict uh, that, that was uh, still there, which still exists, but which was more or less why also the UN was founded uh, 75 years ago. Um, so preparedness, predictive analytics, and then understanding how we can deal with potential scenarios in a more effective way. And that will affect peace operations. And so it goes back to then the configuration. It goes back to um, what is the best mechanism, but also just to give you the example, if you look at environmental degradation, climate change, and its impact on conflict, if we learn to understand this much earlier, we would be able to respond as well. And again, the UN country team comes in, the link to the humanitarian, the link to the development, the link to governance issues comes in, um, and, and absolutely critical. Plus what we will see, and Colombia is actually quite a good example, 
we have more and more middle income countries that are going to be affected by COVID, which means that the state will retreat from certain parts of the country. How do we deal with this? And we will see more of that, including in, in peace configurations of the future. And then if I could just make the link to women, peace and security. Um, I liked very much what Marie Louise -Louis said, this people orientation. Mm. In fact, it came, let's not forget that women, peace and security agenda came from a civil society movement from the global south in the 90s. Uh, that's the lesson learned for the UN, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And it's one that we have to walk the talk every day because that people orientation is so absolutely critical. Um, and women and the role of women and youth in so many situations, be it Ethiopia, be it now, look at Lebanon, uh, look at um, Sudan, uh, you, you, even South Sudan, I mean, I remember having been in South Sudan that I, some of the women leaders told me that they felt absolutely excluded from the peace process. So it is making sure that this meaningful participation at the table is actually achieved and implementing what has been agreed is so, and the accountability to it is so, so critical. So that links very much with the configuration of, of future peace operations. And in fact, UNITAMS is a good example because gender was put forward as, as a priority, mainstreamed, looked at uh, from all perspectives. And hopefully we will learn from, from that as we, as we look at different situations. Volker, thank you for that. And, and picking up on your NAS note, I, I was part of a study in Northern Afghanistan in 2009. And we found uh, with my Afghan colleagues that uh, no men sensed that women were excluded from, from community councils, but all women we spoke of felt excluded. It's, it's very different views uh, on this situation. And I also would like to pick up what you said about understanding the roots uh, of conflicts. I think that uh, if we talk about addressing conflict using peace operations and UN country teams and bilateral, and of course, the work of the, the, the uh, civil society and so on, uh, without understanding the drivers of peace and conflict, that is like doing brain surgery without knowing the symptoms. So, so we need to be professionalized, I think, the way we approach. I say that as a former peace and conflict researcher, sometimes being stunned by, by the lack of, 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 of uh, results-oriented uh, uh, analysis before intervention. We need to wrap up, and we're a bit behind uh, the schedule. So uh, I will give you very clear instructions, and I will be very authoritarian in implement, implementing these. I would like you in maximum one minute, meaning you can be shorter, but maximum one minute, to summarize um, uh, your pitch uh, on this question. And I will ask uh, uh, Carlos to go first, and then Tori, and then Volker, and then marie Louise. okay? Uh, so the question is, uh, as the global landscape scape is changing, what are the key concerns and opportunities, both of them, uh, for improving peace operations in the coming 10 years? So the key, concerns and the opportunities for the coming 10 years. And I will keep the, the, the clock here. Uh, uh, so Carlos, you have maximum one minute to give your pitch. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we have to keep on focusing on uh, our effectiveness. We have to keep on focus how to use better the resources. I, under, I, I completely um, agree that we need resources to work the un needs resources but we also need to find the right uh, the right approach to to effectively use them and then uh, in this case the opportunity is to uh, give the un give the secretariat give the secretary general and through the secretary general ourselves that flexibility in order to respond to mandate implementation but at the same time to adapt ourselves in order uh, constantly in order to 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 be better to, to assess our comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis others and, and do it in, in a better way that taxpayers, but evidently member states are expecting. This is an issue sometimes of balance of power in terms of responsibility and authorities between member states. It's a difficult dis discussion, but I think it's worth for the future because it's a, a concern, but it's also an opportunity going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. And I think I said Tori, so please go ahead. Thanks. I think I've already hit a lot of the practical things, so let me go big picture. The world's in a pretty shaky state, and I don't think the UN should underestimate its ability 
to garner attention from the nations of the world and the peoples of the world for a better future and that vision. I think often when I was in government, I was surprised they asked us what we thought. We need to know what all the international people in the UN system think and to lead us, not just the SG, that's at every level. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of gaps between vision and implementation. Those are problems in plain sight. Let's scoop them up, blow them dust off and do them. Let's not have another resolution. Let's start implementing what we already know. And very briefly, one that works is peace operations work in fragile states. Money is not driven there. Their own, their own budget comes in, buys energy. We're looking at how the use of renewable energy by peace operations could lever access through the SDG frame for the countries that, that don't have access to energy and meet the climate goals of host nations. Let's think creatively. That would be my charge. Thanks. Thank you. 59 seconds. I'm pressed, Tori. You have, you're sharp. Uh, Volker, please go ahead. A couple of points. So integrated holistic analysis. Second, preparedness, 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 which then leads to predictive analytics, strategic foresight, data and evidence-driven analysis, again, linking up very much with that, a more nimble, realistic, adaptable configuration, no one size fits all, cross, stronger cross-fertilization among and within the system, um, partnerships, not just with regional organizations, also much more with international financial institutions, which brings in the UN country team again, and an evolution of mediation that includes increasingly governance issues and constitutional reform and social contract issues. How do we revitalize, reset social contracts within, within countries? Because we, we see the disconnect between institutions and people and their needs and their aspirations. Thank you, Volker, very much. And Marie-Louise, now it's your turn. Please go ahead. Let's see they get the mic going there. This is the new age of technology. technology. I'm sorry. Marie-Louise. I'm sorry. I will build on what Volker has just said. The reality that I have realized with COVID is this one which we knew already, at, at least this is real in Africa. The conflicts we have are now interested conflicts, which means that the solutions will not be the solution, the forceful solutions. There are no solutions by force in this kind of uh, uh, context. It is exactly like in the context of COVID. We are going now to fight against the causes of the issues which are most of the time governance and leadership. Governance and the leadership, so political solutions, which means that if, if uh, UN Security Council or if any other institutions are helping the countries, they will have to work with the countries themselves, the actors, I mean civil society, media, the leaders, and then the communities, work with them to find political solutions that can help the, uh, the countries solve the issues they have, because these are not uh, issues that can be solved by the guns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie-Louise. And I think that connects very well with this year's topic, also looking at peace building from bottom up, uh, ownership in the countries where peace is made. It's not made from the outside. We are observers and supporters, but peace comes from, from the inside. And of course, with a strong gender uh, integration and mainstreaming. Thanks. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you all aboard. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, Marie-Louise, uh, Tori, Volker, and Carlos. What rings in my ear uh, are the words of Tori. I don't think I cite you exactly, but when you spoke that COVID has shown us that there's a need for multilateralism in the future. And, and you know that Challenges Forum want to be such an informal multilateral platform for dialogue, exchange of ideas, and also sharp recommendations. So thanks to all of you for, for contributing today. And um, I also want to welcome the special invitees because the close part of the Challenges Annual Forum starts in uh, only 10 minutes, I think. Um, and the next session, we will explore the dialogue strands, as you know, looking at AU-UN relationships, peace building and sustaining peace from the bottom-up approach, 
with a strong gender mainstreaming point and also looking at the youth. And we also have the issue about effectiveness, looking at uh, primarily management systems like the CPAS and others. Uh, uh, so this will be uh, for the three days, the dialogues. And I would like to welcome those that participate in the open sessions to come back on Friday, because then you can listen to the results of our deliberations. But once again, thanks to you as panelists, you really helped us uh, shape from very different angles, uh, the problems, but also the opportunities we have and, and, and being so sharp to in one minute really provide us with a very bright future, I think, with opportunities. So thanks for joining and uh, have a nice day or evening or night wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.